Welcome to Film Courage episode 150. It's Super Bowl Sunday. We thank you for joining us on the day of Super Bowl 46. I'm Karen Warden. And I'm David Brandon. You can Hello. find our archives. Hello, Karen. Hello. Um, you can find our archives on iTunes, filmcurs.com, latalkradio.com, and Movie Garage. Well, today's guests are director Matt Adams and writer producer Andrew Soltis. They are the filmmaking team behind a feature length documentary, Improv and Everywhere, that chronicles how a group of New York comedians started a cultural phenomenon. Improv Everywhere has been responsible for some of the most original and creative public hoaxes of the internet age. You probably know some of their videos ranging from the Grand Central Station Freeze, the Best Buy hoax, or the yearly No Pants Subway Ride, just to name a few. Yeah, these are some of the best videos on the internet. Hilarious. Um, improv Everywhere is a group which causes scenes of chaos and joy in public places, Created in August 2001 by then-actor comedian Charlie Todd, Improv Everywhere has executed over 100 missions involving thousands of undercover agents. And these stunts have grown Improv Everywhere to have a, a huge fan base, and providing them close to a million YouTube subscribers, over 220 million video views, a Facebook fan page with over 250,000 likes, and a Twitter following of over 26,000. On top of the following, Matt and Andrew helped orchestrate a Kickstarter effort for the documentary film Improv Everywhere that raised over $126,000, and that was just, they just reached their goal, I think it was a little less than a month ago. It was a 40-day campaign, over 1,600 backers, and, and believe in the last day alone, they raised over $9,000. Please welcome to Film Courage via telephone, Matt Adams and Andrew Soltis. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, thanks hey. for having us on. Hey, thanks for being here. We've we've had so much fun doing research for the show, and I just have to put it out there to the audience that if you're ever in a bad mood, if you're ever feeling down, go to YouTube, go to their site, and look at these videos, and you will quickly be out of a bad mood because there's just um, I think my favorite is the uh, is the Starbucks with the to uh, tell us the more PC. about the Starbucks. It, it's just so funny, like these guys bring in or and a girl just. Two total random strangers, supposedly, to the audience view, bring in um, these two desktop computers. They plug in the hard drive, and like one of them's a Dell, and, and the girl's like struggling with the monitor. And the best was this one guy that's so incensed by the fact that they're not like using laptops, and he just like just the looks on people's faces. It's it's priceless. So you got it. You got to see that. So anyway, so, so many great. Thank videos. you for making us laugh over the years. We really appreciate it. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you for both for joining us. Um, and, and let's you know part part of understanding your story, guys, is understanding um, Charlie Todd. So Matt, do you remember the first time you met Charlie Todd? Yeah, I was actually taking classes at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater, um, and I'd seen what he was doing, and I reached out to him and I said, Hey, if you ever need me help. Well, let me know. I had recently graduated from film school, and I was looking for stuff to do on a regular basis. And I liked that what he was doing was positive. Very cool. Well, Andrew, can you tell us who is Charlie Todd? Charlie is, uh, you know, he's, he's sort of hard to figure out. He's not like uh, most comedians you might meet. He's definitely the most serious comedian and improviser that I've ever met. Um, and... If anything, he's very he's very confident uh, about what he likes in uh, you know prank or uh, whether it's improv everywhere or um, for the website or whatever it is. He knows exactly what his taste is, and he's very good at, at achieving that. Um, definitely a unique guy. He originally, I think, came to New York to be an actor, right? Wasn't that his? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, he uh, mm -hmm. he studied and teaches or taught at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater uh, in New York. And um, out of that sort of crew in front of him, where I, originally it was many more people from the theater who were working on uh, missions, which is what uh, the group calls their pranks. Um, uh, but as it grew throughout the years, you know, it's people from the mailing list became involved, and, uh, you know, there, were, there are some missions that have, you know, thousands and thousands of people now. So obviously it's grown much, uh, uh, much, much bigger than just the Charlie and his friends at the theater um, over mm -hmm. the years. Well, I understand. Like the first prank was was it at a bar where someone thought he was Ben Folds, or how did that first transpire? Well, he convinced uh, a group of people that he was Ben Folds. It was like he had recently moved to the city, mm -hmm. and he was just kind of 
excited about the fact that nobody knew who he was. So, I mean, this was back in, like, 2002 when, like, smartphones didn't exist. And, like, right now you couldn't do that prank because somebody would just take up their iPhone, look up Ben Folds, do an image search, and be like, no, this isn't you. <laughs> you know, and, and Matt, you know, for you, um, it is, has, has it gotten to the point where improv everywhere has gotten to be so big that this is your full-time job? Yeah, it is something that I do on a daily basis. I mean, it has grown to the to, to a scope where I feel so lucky to be able to do this on a full time basis. And, and and when did that become the case? You know, like like how many videos does someone have to do? How how many people do you have to reach? You know, to get to a point where you know you're making a living um, from from creating these great little videos on YouTube. Well, it's kind of complicated because about three years ago, I actually left my day job to completely focus on the filmmaking work that I was doing and to also give improv everywhere, like, 100%. Because we were at the time where, like, video cameras were, you know, consumer video cameras were, were good enough where we could compete with broadcast quality uh, work, you know, just, just with having a Mac Pro and, like, an HVX 200. So, you know, I, I'd say, you know, I left my job about three years ago, but I wasn't making a living doing it three years ago. I was working in finance and actually had saved up some money so I could give this a chance. And that was my hope. That was my dream that would, it would actually happen. Uh, were you in a cubicle? I wasn't in a cubicle, <laughs> but I was working in finance. And it okay. was terrible. But at the same time, you know, I felt lucky to have the job just because, you know, of the harsh economy they were in. And, you know, it also allowed me to, to save up and get professional filmmaking equipment. Oh, no, totally. No, there's there's safety within those cubicle, you know, barriers. But And I'm wondering, too, while you're saving up during those three years, are you second-guessing it, saying, you know what, I like the paid vacation, I like the medical benefits? Is this going to be too scary to take this leap? No, for me, it was never a question. For me, it was just always like, how can I get out of this day job and do this full-time? There was never a question about, like, the paid vacations or anything like that. Like, my sole goal has always been just to make good work with, you know, with good people, people that I enjoy being around. Sure, sure. And did you tell your coworkers what your goal was, or did you kind of keep it on the DL and and then that... Well, they had found out about it through, like, the No Pants subway ride, and I think somebody had seen my name. They're like, you, you do this thing? And I'm like, yeah, 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 because it's kind of funny in the world of finance. They're like, oh, well, at night I go home and I make these videos where people take their pants off on the train. Right, right. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the daytime, you're, you're praising Peter Lynch. Well, I'm wondering, too, did you, did you when you gave that two-week notice, if you did, did you kind of hear angels singing, or were you, I mean, did you feel like, hey, I'm on the right path here? when you gave that two weeks notice? You know, I felt like I was on the right path. I was really excited about it. But at the same time, I did ask them if I could, uh, you know, after six months, if okay. there was any way that if things weren't working out, if I could come back to the job. Oh, and wow. my boss said, of course, no problem at all. But my boss's boss's boss was like, no, if he's leaving, he's got to leave. So that was kind of more of like a thrill for me, too. I mean, obviously, it's a little bit scary, but at the same time, it made me give it, rather than 100%, give it 1,000%. Mm -hmm. and, and where do things stand six months out? Well, we were lucky enough to... Um, our MP3 experiments, which is an annual prank that we do, um, was sponsored by Yahoo, where we actually took the prank on tour. Mm -hmm. So... I was able to do, like, when I left my job, I couldn't have actually done both. So that was the catalyst for leaving my job, just because we did have such tight deadlines. So I couldn't have done both. So I just, you know, I jumped right in, and, uh, you know, I worked as hard as I could, you know? Wow, that's really, wow. that's got to wow, feel love, good. I love, love hearing that. And that's great. Andrew, uh, what was your introduction to Improv Everywhere, and, and, and how did you sort of earn the respect of Charlie and Matt and, and, and the whole creative team there? Uh, it was it was about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and uh, it just started off with a really simple project. Matt needed help um, reaching out to different people on YouTube to try to find uh, to to get the original copies of the freezes that were taking place all over the world. So the the Grand Central uh, Frozen Grand Central is the name of the video on YouTube, and it's where. Uh, you know, hundreds of people freeze in place at a given time, and that's sort of really caught on. It's one of the most uh, widely known missions that Improv Everywhere has ever done, and so we were trying to collect uh, videos from around the world, people who did that for the doc. Um, and 
Matt and I worked on that. It was, you know, very part time, very slow. No, I wasn't getting paid. It was just because I loved improv everywhere, and and I had seen the videos on YouTube. Um, and out of that, we started working together a little bit more because we really got along. Um, and it just sort of grew and grew from there, where we were finding things that we were in sync with, and we just sort of became a good yin and yang, and and partnered up well. Um, and as we were working on the doc, Charlie, you know, because uh, there's not uh, a whole ton of people involved in the core group of improv everywhere. Um, I started helping out with a few of the actual missions, and um, I actually edited uh, some of the remastered videos, um, like the the Best Buy video that came out, mm-hmm. um, which was a, you know, came out in I think '05, and and I recut the whole thing and remastered it, and so I've been helping out with a few of those things. Um, but it really was just sort of a you know, a, a creative connection, and it just sort of grew out of that. And and so, uh, how long have you guys been friends for? Then is this is this a more recent friendship, or how long do you guys go back? I'd say a little over a year. I mean, yeah, okay. like what Andrew said, so it's spot on. Like we just became fast friends, and we just started working together. And like I, I think that's like a key to like obviously to to to, to making you know work that you believe in. It's just having people around you that are totally positive and supportive of each other. Yeah, because I was just thinking, Matt, I mean, you know, you guys have probably had a lot of people, a lot of people that have tried to get involved with your success. You know, they see the videos, they laugh, they crack up, and they try to somehow um, gain access to you guys, gain gain access to the inner circle. What What is it about Andrew where, where you sort of allowed him in? And, 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 and so what, what stood out about Andrew? Well, it's kind of like any relationship where it's like you feel that you are doing something that you believe in and they are also adding things to help fulfill your vision. So sometimes I'll see something and, you know, I will do like the best that I can with it and then I'll talk to Andrew about it and then he'll add something new to it, something that works that I didn't see and vice versa. Okay. All right. No, forgive me. I was. I was. <laughs> you caught me mid sip there. <laughs> so just, just, just drink like some, else some good old, you know, Kirkland signature <laughs> yes, drinking water. It's not beer, folks. <laughs> yeah, it's just Super water. Bowl Sunday. The drink of lions and um, tigers. Yeah. You know, come, coming back around though, because here, here's what I get fascinated about is um is Charlie Todd and these videos. They've been seen millions of times over. You know, 220 million views, and and he's an actor. He's right there in New York. And I just can't help but wonder how many times is he offered various TV roles, film roles? Is that happening? Well, Charlie has offered, you know, he has been offered, uh, you know, jobs in the past, but it's never been like a priority for him. Of course, when he moved to New York, it was slightly different. But, you know, he really, his problem with acting was a lot of the problems that I think I had and a lot of what creative people have is that they, they feel so little control with other people's work. So Improv Everywhere was a way for him to be creative and for him to use his own voice rather than having to just read somebody else's lines. Right, and, and to sort of wait by the phone or, or whatever for someone to choose him. Why yeah, you know, he was really proactive about that. Like, you know... I in one of the interviews that I had with him, he just said, you know, I decided at a bar one night, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to give it everything I have, and I'll just see how it goes. Yeah, and then what he's doing a TED Talks, and then he's also he has a book, doesn't he, with another gentleman? Yeah, he has a book. Okay. Yeah, he has a book with um, another senior agent, Alex Gordalis, and they wrote, uh, yeah, causing a scene. Causing a scene. Okay. You know, and and coming back to to sort of. Um just the, the people that 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 have gained gained a, a, a claim and attention on the internet. You know, wh- why do you guys think that we don't see as much integration of internet celebrities and mainstream television? You know, is is it still sort of like this little brother syndrome? Wh- wh- when are we going to uh-huh. see more integration, more crossover between these worlds? I like that little brother. Well, you know, I, I think you know the worlds have collided very quickly. And it's one of those things where, you know, we did have a television pilot in 2007. In 2007, a lot of, you know, network executives were looking at YouTube like, oh, my gosh, this is the best new thing. Or this is the, this is the brand new thing. And, you know, they had reached out to Improv Everywhere. And I think the network also reached out to another YouTube channel, Barats and Beretta. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, both of us had pilots, and mm. neither of them were picked up. Oh, okay. There's also something you know, very different between the type of YouTube video that is like a one-hit wonder and those people who are creating consistently good content like Improv Everywhere. So I think asking 
sort out all the sort of you know one time hits it's harder to find that many things that could really be adapted for a longer format sure yeah you know that's that's a great point because mm-hmm. you know what works it is is two or three minutes may be like the perfect link to just you know put a link in the email and click send to your friend mm-hmm right do either of you like being in front of the camera and featured in any of these stunts? I'd say, you know, I don't mind it, but like, mm-hmm. you know, because I come from a little bit of a background in acting. So before, when I was younger, I was a little bit more all over the place. Like I was a musician. I, you know, I was interested in acting and stand up comedy. But when I really started, when I got my first video camera, it was just like, I, I enjoyed being behind the camera so much more just because I just, I love working with people and I just love working pe- with people through certain processes. Mm-hmm. And Andrew? I, and I, I am a, a fully behind the camera guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, I do not, I have accidentally been, um, I think I've been in a couple of clips of a couple of Impreventable videos purely by accident. Okay. Wow. So Matt, all these years you've never appeared in any of the, the Improv Everywhere videos? Um, I've been in them in random spots. Like it's always fun to be able to, even in the trailer, like there's a part where I have my camera out and I'm in it, but I'm just like in the background. Um, and earlier you mentioned the mobile desktop prank and the one guy that was just <laughs> saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe that these people have these giant computers. I was the one that actually interviewed him. Sometimes oh, I play the role of the film student that just happened to have a video camera on it. So sometimes my voice is in them, but I'm not actually in front of the camera. And how are you able to play this straight? I just, it just, I, you don't, I mean, how are you able to do that? It's yeah, how, how is the camera not shaking the entire time from you laughing? <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, just to, to, because I know what it's like to get shaky footage. And, you know, over the years, you know, we've had so many different cameramen. So it's just a goal that I have to just play it as absolutely straight as I can and actually to talk as little as I can to leave other people the opportunity to, you know, for them to to try to figure out exactly what it is. Because when I first started, I would talk a little bit too much and then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm cutting off their great lines. So I stopped and it was just, I would only say things to to get them to start talking more. That's great. Yeah, the other thing is, it, it is sort of an improv everywhere, sort of a misnomer because these missions are very highly choreographed and, and planned. And usually, when we're uh, when we're doing one of the, shooting one of them, um, we've been able to rehearse it, and you know, it's got it, it, we're going to do it several times or whatever it is, just to make sure we get it exactly the way we want it. Um, so, you know, usually we're we're highly planned beforehand, and we're not you know too broken up by what's happening. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely like really planned out, but there are things that we can just never anticipate, like that one guy at the Starbucks or just a random person getting yeah. excited, needing to talk to us. Right, and I think there was a guy on the subway too, right, that thought that it was real and you guys all had to break character. Didn't you think that there was a real fight? And he got upset. Yeah, that was for our Jar Jar subway car last year. Oh. And uh, yeah, a guy was just like, oh my gosh, this is a real... like." He didn't even believe us after we told him it was fake. Right. Um, but then we had to, like, actually have the actors look up, smile, he realized it was fake, and then he kind of laughed because he was like, oh, my God, I've just been at We are on the line with Matt Adams and Andrew Soltis, part of the creative team behind Improv Everywhere and the upcoming Improv Everywhere documentary film. Um and, you know, you guys have been talking about that you plan these stunts intricately um, and you take you take some time out. Can, can you talk a little bit more about you know, how much time do you really put in and, and how and, and, and maybe a little bit more about the rehearsal process? Well, I mean, it, it varies from prank to prank. Like if you take something like our No Pants subway ride, it's more of just trying to figure out the train lines, trying to figure out who is going to run each train line, because as it's gotten so big, we have to have a series of what we call generals, people to take on the responsibility so people know exactly what to do. Um, but then if you take another prank like we've done called the Say Something Nice prank, where we had a podium built and we had a megaphone attached to it and we just had a placard that said Say Something Nice, more work goes into the actual construction of, like, I guess props. It's, you know, even though we do, you know, internet videos, we still do have, like, props. 
And then how many stunts have you done? And then once you review the footage, you say, you know what? I'm not really feeling this. Has that ever happened? No, that's mm -hmm. actually, it's never happened. Okay. Um, there has been a couple pranks that we've tried to do that we want to do again, but there's never been one that's like, oh, I don't like this idea. Because, you know, we always are sure of ourselves in terms of the idea. Like, we fall in love with the idea when it, you know, when it comes to us or Charlie or somebody that has pitched it to us through the Internet. So we're usually pretty comfortable in, with, with what we're actually doing. So that, that's never actually happened. And were there any uh, pranks that were unsuccessful in terms of the audience reaction? Um, you know, I think that our April Fool's pranks sometimes get a lot of criticism. Um, because, you know, we, we do a prank every April 1st. You know, an April Fool's prank to sort of, it's for our internet audience. So one year we did one called The Best Funeral Ever. It was based off of our uh, best game ever prank, where we turned a little deep league game into a, a professional major league game. We had a right. blimp. We had people announcing the game, hot dog vendors. All the players had, like, baseball cards, programs that were being handed out. So we thought, you know, if we do a prank where we have a family with, you know, the person that died didn't have a lot of surviving relatives, we can show up and give them the best funeral that they've ever obviously their only funeral, but give them an amazing funeral. And people looked at that like it was real. And they were just like, how dare you do this? This is so disrespectful. But the entire thing was fake. I mean, the family was, everybody was composed of actors. My parents were actually an older couple in it to give it a little bit more legitimacy. Um, and, you know, we had a fake coffin. And you'd think that people would, would know that it was fake because we had a Dracula coffin. I mean, if you looked a little closer, <laughs> you could see that there was a Dracula coffin. We had somebody play the priest and everything. Um, yeah, so definitely sometimes people uh, do see these things in a way that's like, how could you think that we would actually do this? And I understand a few of the pranks have gotten you, or, or maybe Charlie, into some hot water, like the U2 hoax. I think he was, what, on the top of his apartment complex roof and the cops came? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was... That was really interesting because I think there was a part of Charlie that wanted to get arrested. Because when it came down to it, you know, that's how the actual U2 performance happened. So I was watching some of the footage, and there was a moment where Charlie looked at somebody and he says, you know, if, if the cops do come and arrest us, that, that would be perfect because that's exactly what happened. And when it came down to it, you, know, you really can't get in a ton of trouble playing music on a roof. Right, and then Andrew, tell us what happened with the Best Buy hoax. Like, uh, I guess security was called, or the police were called? Yeah, the, the uh, police were called by Best Buy, um, and they showed up and essentially were told, uh, told the store employees that it's, a, it's not illegal to wear blue shirt and khaki pants, so um, <laughs> it, it made for a great video. You know, it, it, it was a great um, punchline, but... Um, day on Best Buy was not too pleased because, you know, we do uh, some of these where the prank takes place in a store, and it is sort of interesting, you know, is that really uh, a problem? Is it public space? Is it some of that flat questions? And in this case, although it rarely happens, um, they thought it was appropriate to, to call the cops, and, and when the cops got there, they didn't really know what to say, but um, it was an interesting, it was an interesting moment for sure. Yeah. You know, and, and and behind the scenes, I mean, how, how much pressure do you guys feel to sort of top the last video or, 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 or continue to improve and get better and, and reach more and more people? I mean, do you guys put a lot of pressure on yourselves? Personally, I don't, you know, because I think if you, the more pressure you feel, the, the worse it's going to come out. So I just try to give every prank 100% just because when you're constantly feeling pressure, you're thinking about that pressure, not what you should actually be doing. And, and Andrew, as as a relative newcomer to the team, you know wh what have you observed for, from these guys in, in terms of how they go about strategizing and preparing and, and executing these videos? Um, one thing that's that's always really struck me is is uh, how meticulous everything is. It, it seems you know for every bit that it seems whimsical and fun in the videos online, there's that much planning and thought that goes into it. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's in 
some ways like a film shoot, although it's not, you know, it's not nearly as um, complex, but, you know, there there's the equivalent of call sheets and there's the equivalent of, um, you know, releasing things when it's going to be the best for the YouTube audience. And, you know, there's a whole, uh, you know, there's a whole study you could do about the best way to release these videos online and the, the best way to reach your audience and all that kind of stuff. So I've always been amazed how this is sort of like a little mini studio model where there are a lot of things that mirror what you do in at least a feature film, um, but with these short little videos for the internet. You know, and, and Matt, I mean, you kind of already hinted at it um, that you do receive ideas, but it, it makes me wonder how, how many ideas are, are self generated amongst your crew, and, and how often do you have folks submitting ideas, and, and how often will you actually take one of those ideas and go out and, and create the stunt? Well, I think Charlie gets submissions on a daily basis. You know, especially when somebody finds out, finds out that he's the improv everywhere guy, the first thing they want to do is be like, oh my gosh, you guys should do this prank, or you guys should do that prank. <laughs> Um, but, you know, as we were talking about Best Buy, that prank was actually submitted by a high school student in Texas, I believe. And Charlie got the email, and when Charlie gets an email of an idea that he likes, his eyes just light up. And so he emailed the kid back immediately, because the kid said, what you guys should do is you should get all your agents, blue polo shirts, khaki pants, go into a Best Buy and just stand around or do it with red shirts and khaki pants and go to a Target. Oh, so Charlie totally. emailed him back and was like... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, random stranger on the internet. We're doing this next week. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and, and does, and does, I mean, because you can't help but wonder, like, you know, because you said, you know, you've kind of made this transition where improv everywhere becomes your full time job and you start hearing of these big companies that are involved in these videos, whether it be Starbucks, Best Buy. I mean, there you sort of mentioned Target. I mean, is the money coming solely from YouTube um, partner program or are you getting sponsorship money from these companies? We definitely are not getting sponsorship from Starbucks or Target or Best Buy. They would like us not to be doing what we're doing. Um, <laughs> you know, they are, you know, super happy about it, you know, especially when we go into their store. You know, it's all they want, like, like they should, is for their business to run smoothly. Um, but, you know, we do get some, uh, some money through, like, sponsorships where we'll do a video and somebody will say, hey, we'd like to sponsor one of your videos. You don't have to mention our name in the video, but if you could put a card at the end saying, like, brought to you by, kind of like the PBS model. So that is something that has happened more and more. And it still it hasn't happened a ton, but those videos do help out in terms of, like, helping to pay the bills. Sure. And those are mostly for videos that we couldn't do otherwise, like, for example, the, the musicals where it requires a tremendous amount of Planning totally. cameras, like you know, hidden cameras and uh, you know, uh, construction to set everything up, and things that you know have a really high budget um, that we couldn't put together just on our own. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, has the online space gotten more competitive? I mean, are there other improv groups out there trying to outdo you guys? Um, there are definitely other groups that are trying to imitate. I don't know. If, I don't. I don't think there's any. Uh, like competitor that releases on a schedule like in front of everywhere. Mostly, what what I've noticed is the trend with advertisers to copy the sort of flash mob because it's very buzzy, it's very trendy, and you know Microsoft and a, a number of big companies have taken this sort of type of short video because they think it's like a very viral, viral, marketable thing, and they go out and they do mm. their own flash mob, which is a it's not a term related with. Uh, to improv everywhere, but they go out and you know they pay a hundred actors to dance in Times Square or something like that. And there, there have been. There actually was an ad. Matt, you were you mentioned this the other day. The, the ad at Grand Central. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. There was an ad at Grand Central where you know because one of our most famous videos is Frozen Grand Central, where totally. we had two hundred people freeze in place at Grand Central Station at a specified time. Everybody moved as if nothing had happened. Now, there was recently a commercial where a guy shows up in something that really, it seems like Grand Central Station, and he's got like a raincoat, a big trench coat on, and at a, at a time, he looks at his watch, he tears off his, his coat, and starts dancing, and then he immediately gets a text that says, the flash mob location has been changed to such and such. So it is cool, though, in a way, to see, you know, our work being... Kind of just sort of like infiltrating the mainstream, you know, what people are seeing on a daily basis to, to, to see that somebody actually knows what this is. Yeah, that's terrific. 
you know, and you guys had mentioned a little bit about um, this sort of the largest production budget that you've had for any of these stunts. What's the biggest scale thing you guys have done? I don't really know what the largest one we have. I mean, you know, even like something that like the no pants subway ride, you know, those are like, we don't really put a dime into it. You know, we, we have all of our own equipment. So our model is pretty much not to spend anything unless we absolutely need it. And like Andrew said, like some of those are the bigger pranks, like the, you know, the musical, because those cost a lot more. You have to hire somebody that looks like a Santa Claus. You have to get location releases from like a mall. You have to have all of those hidden cameras installed and have a control room. So, you know, we choose those pranks to do with advertisers because the ones that we do, we really try not to put any money into it because we aren't making a ton of money out of it. You know, we, you know, we, we make very little from it. So we try to, you know, only have those big pranks with, with brands. Mm -hmm. And we're always shocked by the amount of companies that donate their services, whether, I mean, we've encountered this in a major way with the film, but even with the regular video releases, there are just, there's just a lot of excitement about making these videos come together. So a lot of people donate um, their time, their equipment, their services, et cetera, just to see it, just to see it happen. And Andrew, which has been your favorite hoax and why? Oh man, that's a tough one. I think I have to say Best Buy just because I've spent so much time with it and uh, I actually got to see the raw tapes of you know, the day of. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you see it, although it would not make for a good YouTube video, two hour raw tape from the, from the <laughs> day of, um, it's really fascinating to watch this thing happen over the course of the amount of time it took on the tape. Um, it was a really cool experience to see that. So I, I'd have to say that's by. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Matt? Um, it's really hard for me to say because they're all special in different reason, for different reasons. But if I had to pick, I would say either High Five Escalator or King Philip the Fourth. Oh yeah. Um, I'll go into King Philip the Fourth just because it was fun the way we documented it. We went to uh, the we went to the museum and uh, we had somebody that had looked like he just looked like King Philip the Fourth. He was standing in front of a painting and you know he said he looked at his mom and was like, Oh my gosh, are you seeing this? I look exactly like this guy. So he had a costume built, he had a costume made, and we went to the museum and basically he stood in front of it and was offering to sign autographs. Charlie worked as kind of like his his little his manager and was saying, you know, we do have Prince of King Philip the Fourth. If you'd like an autograph, we'd be more than happy to provide that for you. And King Philip the Fourth was just kind of quiet, and you know he was signing autographs. And what was so fun about it for me was because it took a traditional, you know, experience at a museum and just made it more lively. Um, so people were coming up and getting autographs. And now with today's technology, we had everybody that was shooting was using DSLRs, and I had like. Um, you know, I had everybody lob, but I had like a little sound mixer stuffed down my pants. So at the end of the day, like we did get kicked out, but nobody even knew we were making a video because filming in the museum is, is not legal. It was kind of like a thrill of like being able to pull it off. It was kind of like a combination of liking the idea and also liking the way that we were able to pull it off because we wouldn't have been able to do something like that 10 years ago because mm -hmm. video cameras were so much bigger. Well, you know, too, it's funny because I think, you know, New Yorkers get a bad rap, but they have such a great sense of humor and, and a great heart to them. Do you think that a lot of these pranks have been successful because they've been in New York and people kind of, they seem to bond together, especially post 9-11? At least in, in, in my California eyes, that's what it seems like, but I could be wrong here. Well, I think it goes both ways, just because... We did this one prank called Look Up More where we had about 75 people dressed in black standing in a series of windows. And at a specified time, Charlie would put his hand, he was watching uh, everybody from the windows on the street level. And it was four levels. So he would put his hand on the trash can and it would let them do something. And then he would take it off the trash can. And that was to go on to the next step. Now, when you see 75 people in windows dressed in black, especially fairly close to, to, to being right after 9-11, it can create some concern, mm. um, which which totally makes sense. Sure. Um, you know, security guards would come out and just be like, what are you guys doing? Because, you know, they, they aren't trained to, you know, for performance art. You know, they're just trying to do their job and to have things run smoothly. Of course, that's, we would we'd never do anything like that, you know, to, to, to take over a store or do anything malicious. But, you know, it is a concern. Um, so, 
you know, I, I think it goes both ways. Like, I think, you know, for a prank like High Five Escalator, where we have, you know, one of our agents, Rob Lathan, giving thousands of high fives at the top of an escalator, that's something different, where it's like, it's definitely less threatening. But something where you see 75 people dressed in black, I mean, I can see how that could be a little bit scary. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> or if you see 80 people dressed as Best Buy employees. <laughs> You know, I, I can't help but wonder, um, have you ever had any sort of, because you know, sometimes these stunts, you're involving hundreds of people, thousands of people. Have you had any renegades who sort of try to somehow sabotage <laughs> one of these one of these skids or, or stunts? You know, like they get themselves oh. on the inside and then they try to just do something just totally, just totally stupid or something? We haven't. I think that's one of the reasons that we haven't is just because, you know, it's, it's like a small group of people. I mean, when it comes down to it, there's really only a few of us involved with, you know, making the video. So we really, it, it, it's such a tight-lipped group of people. So it's its never actually happened where the word has got out and somebody has showed up to, to one of these pranks that try to ruin it. And Andrew, now you have some additional big names behind the film, right? Including uh, Parks and Recreation's Aubrey Plaza, musician Ben Folds, and comedian Nick Kroll. How did they come on board? Yeah, that's actually uh, probably a better question for Matt because he uh, spent so long prepping all his interviews and doing all the interviews. I wasn't really on board uh, until after all that had been completed. So, Matt, okay. you want to sure. take that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, Aubrey, you had mentioned earlier the girl with the you know the giant computer on her lap. That was actually Aubrey Plaza in that prank. Okay. That was great. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, and like I said, you know, these are such small things that, you know, sometimes we'll do something with 200 people, and sometimes we'll do something with, like, three or four. And, you know, I think there's more of a concern for the for the prank idea getting leaked when there's a large group of people. But something like King Philip IV, you know, I didn't mention the name of the museum, but it was the Museum of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is, like, one or two people, it's harder for that. To, to get out and to get leaked for somebody to ruin. But back to your question about, you know, the celebrities, Nick Kroll was one of the people that was dancing in the windows at Look Up More. Okay. Um, so, you know, they had participated in some of our pranks, and, you know, over the course of the, the documentary being made, they became famous um, or were starting to become famous. And, you know, when we were able to, when we started cutting it together, it was just nice to have some celebrity names attached. So, Matt, whose idea was it to make the documentary? Um, well, I approached Charlie about it, I'd say, a little over three years ago, and I was still working at the bank, and that was something that I said, you know, I think we should have a documentary, to, because we, we have these videos that are being seen by millions of people, but the longest video is probably, like, I'd say maybe six or seven minutes. So, for me, it was something that I really was passionate about in terms of creating a feature-length documentary, and also it was a learning experience for me. I'd never made a feature-length documentary before, and instead of going back to school to get my master's, I thought to myself, you know what, I think with this group of people that I know, I, I can make this happen, and it'll be an incredible learning experience for me without having to drop, you know, $100,000 on getting my master's. Hmm. And, and, and so, you know, there you have the idea. When did you start? Because obviously, I mean, three years ago, I mean, did you start filming the documentary three years ago? Or is... Yeah. Okay, so it's been ongoing for three for three years, and then when did you start thinking, okay, you know what, maybe we should turn to Kickstarter to help us, um, you know, finish this movie? I'd say, Andrew, what do you think about like six months ago, five six months ago? Yeah, I mean, we we had sort of had it in the back of our mind. We didn't necessarily think Kickstarter until five or six months ago. We, we knew we were going to need to do some fundraising, and I think initially our thought was private investors go the typical film route, but um, yeah, and then we then we after much discussion decided to go Kickstarter. You say much discussion. I mean, was it a struggle deciding, you know, whether um, to, to launch a campaign? And, and in, in, the, in the end, why did you do it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think um, in the end, it came down to uh, we thought it was right for the audience that would, would uh, be watching the film. And we thought, um, you know, in private viewers is so... Uh, driven by the internet that we would already have an existing base um, of people we could draw on to help support the film uh, and also because um, we we thought it would be a great way to build press now it, instead of just going to one or two private investors, you know, Kickstarter is a great way to start spreading the word so you know, there are some people we still want to interview there's some uh, footage we still need to get um, we have a lot of 
more work left to do on the film, so we thought it'd be a great way to, to generate buzz, uh, which it did. We got, uh, you know, probably a hundred emails from different people throughout the course of the campaign, whether it was just, you have my support, or some people offering to compose for the film, or, you know, provide post services, things like that, people who had, you know, access to video equipment that said, you know, I want to help you shoot the rest of it, or whatever it is, so, you know, it, it definitely went much further than just the monetary aspect of the campaign. There's a whole, a whole other thing happening there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing is, like, in terms of, like, the buzz that it's created, like, if we had a couple private investors, we wouldn't be doing this interview right now. So, I mean, like, like even, like, just something like this is so cool that, like, people are seeing what we're doing and want to talk to us about it, because we're excited about it, but if it was just a couple people involved with providing the funds, we wouldn't be doing this. Oh, very cool. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. I remember, yeah, David, it. when you, you, you showed me the, the Kickstarter video and... Yeah, I no, that, you know, yeah. yeah, we know we can, but you know, but we've we've been familiar with these videos for a while. You oh know? yeah, you know, I think you know when we've been telling Grand people Central. in preparation for this interview, we, we've been telling people about the the freezing in Grand Central mm -hmm. Station and and sort of pants off in the, in the New York subway. Right. You know, then all of a sudden, you know, because we mentioned Best Buy and, and maybe they haven't seen that or heard of that, and we mentioned a couple other things, but then we mentioned those two, and then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off. Well, I'm wondering too, Matt, like what kind of chaos are you experiencing behind the scenes? You're raising over 100K, you have 1,600 backers. I, I mean, people probably think it just seems so easy, but I'm sure it was a lot of like a roller coaster ride, wasn't it? Yes, it completely was. And Andrew was the campaign manager. And he, Andrew, I think you'd be better for this question. Um, yeah, because he was amazing in terms of like, really making sure that everything was accounted for. It was a full-time job for us for 40 days. I mean, we would work on this thing like 15 to 17 hours a day. Definitely a full-time job, and the hardest, I would say the hardest thing about it is just keeping the momentum going. I mean, it's really, a lot of it comes down to uh, just, you know, marketing yourself and your film, like Matt said, 17 hours a day for 40 days, and uh, you know, you you can get halfway and you get to hit that forty or fifty thousand dollar mark. You can't. I mean, you can take a, only a half a second to take a breath and appreciate that you've gotten that far. And you know, it's so hard because as this is all happening, you're you, you're like shocked and touched that all these people are donating to the film. It's incredible. It's hard to it's hard to see fifty thousand dollars and say, okay, I want another fifty thousand or else this isn't going to happen. It's you know, it's, it's tough not to just say, wow, I this is incredible. I you have to keep going back every day. You gotta send, you know, I, I probably sent a thousand emails over the course of the campaign just about the campaign. Um, you know, whether it's to journalists or, you know, uh, blogs, things like that, just to spread the word and, and, you know, hope that people will not only donate money, but donate space on their website to refer traffic to the web, to the uh, Kickstarter and things like that. And Andrew, when did it reach sort of the height of a frenzy? Was it the last day? Of the campaign? Well, it's it's always the first and the last days that are the biggest, uh, just as a result of the way, you know, the excitement goes. And at the beginning, everyone's just seeing it. They want to give it that initial boost. And in the end, everyone wants to see it happen. Um, I should also mention that at the end, there are a handful of people who say, oh, no, this is actually happening. i got to get my pledge out. Um, but more than that, you know, probably... 40 times that that number of people are the number of people that increased their pledge. You know, we sent out a message that last day that said, hey, we've come this far, we're so thankful for what you did, and if everyone could bump their pledge up a couple of bucks, it would really help put us over the top, and hundreds of people did that that last day, so it's just really incredible. Um, yeah, and then as I, as I was saying, the first and last day, the middle was the most difficult. Around the holidays, we were at a standstill. We were raising. There was one day where I think we raised, you know, five or six hundred bucks the whole day. And when you see that and you calculate the numbers, we needed to be raising over three thousand a day. So it's it's real tough to have those days. It's sort of discouraging, but you've got to just get back up the next morning and keep keep going, going, going. We were doing a lot of prep work during that time to get ready for after the holidays, so we could really um, hit strong as soon as everyone started using their computers again. Mm. Yeah, we had those days ourselves with a couple campaigns we are with where you just think it's not going to happen, and it's that lull in the yeah. middle. Besides the, the time commitment that you talked about, the 15 to 17 hours a day, what are some other misconceptions people have about crowdfunding? I mean, the, you guys make it look so easy, as so many other campaigns do. I think people, 
people, and I, I, as you mentioned earlier in the in the broadcast, um, I wrote an article uh, with Matt for the website, the Film Coach website. Um, one of the things I mentioned in there is, uh, you know, I, I think there's still this conception that Kickstarter is a tool to reach out to friends and family for donations for your project. But the biggest thing that we were focused on is getting that random person in some random country that we've never talked to before to get interested and donate to the film. And, and that's the, the biggest thing I learned for sure is that it's a game of uh, getting the word out beyond your media networks. You know, if you get deep enough and go far enough in enough circles, you'll start hitting people that are new, that have never heard of Improv Everywhere. So while we got a lot of uh, support from, you know, people who see the videos and are on the mailing list, things like that, we got more support from people who had never heard of it or never been a part of it before, which is which was really great for us. We were really happy about that. Yeah, that was, that was amazing to feel that level of support from people that we've never met or maybe will never be. Yeah, and it was cool, too, because in your article, um, you have a, a hyperlink to a Gawker.com article entitled End Online Panhandling Han- Forever, and it's a, it's a pretty, wow, I mean, it's a in-your-face article, but it's actually really good about what some people perceive as, as crowdfunding, and they, they liken it to right. getting that icky feeling at a party when your friend talks about Amway, you know, or, or tries to sell you on some multi-level marketing thing. So I, it, it's interesting how you, you, you tied that in, because I think it is very true, and people are getting turned off, and, and finding that way to do it as successful um, as you can is great. And you mentioned eight different things, and I thought it was great. You said um, prepare press contacts, identify your network, Choose your niche targets, um, you know, incentives, and uh, be human, be visual. I thought that were, those were all great points. Um, we're running out of time here, guys. I'm so sorry, but uh, we're getting the signal to wrap up. We want to thank you both. Um, when, when do we envision the film will be all finished? We are looking for release in 2013, early in 2013, we hope. Oh, that's fantastic. And is that going to be on the Improv Everywhere site, or will you have your own site for that? We'll probably have, um, it'll probably be on both, but we're going to, we're not sure exactly how we're going to distribute it yet, but those details will be on if you can follow our Twitter or, or, you know, all the updates will probably be on the Improv Everywhere site and there's a little film tab to keep you updated with where we're at. Oh, very cool. And I should also mention there's a, uh, there's a new mission coming up tomorrow, so check out uh, improveverywhere.com oh, or great. the YouTube channel Improv Everywhere. Oh, so, very cool. So it's a br- the video is already done and it's being uploaded tomorrow? Yes, it's going up tomorrow morning. Oh, beautiful. Oh, can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) Day day after the Super Bowl. (laughs) I love it. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-oh. You know, for more on the film, please visit Kickstarter and search Improv Everywhere. Um, Also, check out ImprovEverywhere.com. On Twitter, um, Improv Every uh, Film they have, and also Improv Every uh, for the for just for the movement itself, uh, Facebook dot com slash improv dot everywhere, and of course, you know, head over to YouTube and just go through the whole collection um, at Improv Everywhere. Well, yeah. again, thank you, gentlemen, and uh, look forward to seeing uh, tomorrow's uh, prank. Very, very excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and the best thing I great. the best thing I can say to you guys is we had a lot of fun um, just just doing the research on this and diving oh, into all the time. videos. And I think part of what we want to do today is we want to head back. And, and maybe continue the research even after the interview and just continue to explore what you guys have done. So yeah. th- we, we, we can't be uh, more thrilled to have you join us on the program today. Yeah, thank you both. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, okay. thank you. Oh, yeah. Very welcome. And thank you, Ronan, out there, and, and for all that you do for us. Yeah, yeah Ronan, our, our Hold chief together, engineer here yep. at LA Talk Radio. Thank <laughs> you, Ronan. And would you like to hear your project or business mentioned during one of our shows or displayed on our site? To advertise with FilmCourage.com and our radio program, please inquire through filmcourage.com via our contact page. And next Sunday coming up, as mentioned, uh, filmmaker Meg Pinsano, an uh, award-winning filmmaker, um, festival screen director, and screenwriter in Los Angeles. She is the founder of the production company Thirsty Girl Films, which is the semi-exclusive content provider for the auteur filmmaking website Movie Garage. And Meg is currently working on a feature doc entitled Guapa Beautiful, a visually compelling story about a Filipino family's remarkable journey to help their three kids with facial deformities. For more on Meg, please visit ThirstyGirlFilms.com, at ThirstyGirlFilm on Twitter, and FeastOfTheFoolish.com, a short film which they shot in Joshua Tree, California. And until next Sunday, have a great week.